So after spending so much time studying genital uh, mutilation and general cutting practices in the world, I have noticed some things that are very you know, basically common among all the different kinds, regardless of whether you're talking about a male, or female, or, or intersex. Uh, with the male and female, the, the word circumcision is commonly used. Uh, there's other uh, terms uh, with different languages, but uh, in the English-speaking language, language is what people typically think of. Or you might just think of male circumcision and female genital mutilation and never consider calling it female circumcision, even though in the cultures that do it, the uh, it's the kind of word that they use. So I came up with this idea that, you know, uh, I, I see these separate groups that are fighting for just one or the other or the other um, right for genital autonomy for just one of the three. And so there's like intersex, um, like interact advocates the intersex advocates for protecting children that are born with intersex attributes. And then, of course, you've got your female genital mutilation uh, activists. And then you have guys, you have people like the Blood Save Men and, um, and other organizations that are activists about, well, it at least appears to be male circumcision, but, uh, or male genital mutilation. The thing is, though, when it comes to the people that are fighting, um, that you typically see fighting about the male side of it, is primarily in the U.S. You see some in Europe as well. Uh, and it, it, you know, some of the signs are focused on what happened to boys. But I have not met a single um, activist that speaks out against male general cutting practices that do not believe that everyone has the right to genital autonomy. So they also support the intersex and female uh, activists, but not necessarily the other way around. Uh, but I thought of this idea of this weed and uh, and when you think about you know trying to get rid of weed, you you dig it up by the roots. If you don't remove the roots, then it just keeps on coming back. And we can't just pluck off one leaf of the root and not expect that leaf or another leaf to grow back. And when you really dig to the roots, you, know, you keep asking why. And this is something actually I, I learned at one of the companies I worked for when you actually went through this process where we were trying to figure out what the root cause of a systemic problem was in the company. And, uh, and you're supposed to kind of revert to like what a you know, child does. Why, mommy? Why? And mommy will give an answer, and but it's not an answer that gets to the root of the thing. So the child asks why again. Uh, until you get down to the root of, you know, not just the symptoms of the issue, but the actual root of the issue. So, when I started looking at this, you know, a lot of people think, you know, culture, religion, um, money, and greed, and those are the reasons why. But, look underneath those, and you look at what how those things started, the real roots are control, aesthetics, and economics. Uh, the, <clears throat> the control part, uh, it started out as an attempt to rein in sexual drive. Not that I think it works. <laughs> People thought that by cutting off this sort of part of you know, someone's body, whether you're talking about the male um, foreskin, which has been proven to be the most erogenous, most touch, you know, light touch sensitive part of the penis, um, removed. 
then that will reduce chances of masturbation or, or reduce drive to sex and maybe the man will focus more on, um, uh, on God or whatever, spirituality. Uh, and the same thing, that uh, same excuses that are often used for female general cutting practices. And it, I, uh, I would bet that it comes up in certain cases when it comes to intersex uh, normalization or binary surgeries that you, know, don't, you don't want the child to be sexually normal or whatever, so you're trying to control that child's sexuality, even with intersex. Um, so it's also expanded to include cultural conformity, right? So, uh, I say this because people are being controlled by their culture by choice or their parents are desiring to conform to the culture they are in and are and, and or they wish to control the conformity of their child. Being separated from the herd is a very powerful fear, thus a very difficult route to pull out. I believe this fear is also what drives us to be ignorant about the topic, meaning not wanting to learn about the practices for fear that we may realize that it's wrong. And then aesthetics, you know, does it look better? I hear it all the time, I see it all the time. People think that the the penis without the foreskin, without it being looking like an anteater or an elephant trunk or whatever, looks better. Well, I think that that's our cultural uh, bias, our cultural, um, we've, been, we've just been, you know, we've been indoctrinated to think that. Um, we hear it so much in uh, particularly in areas where the, uh, the profusely amputated penis is typical, we uh, just automatically think, well, that looks better because it's more common. So it's kind of built into our thinking. For me, after I, once I learned about how the natural penis works, I just think it looks mutilated. But when all you see is Again, when all you see is previously amputated peni, it's, it's understandable why people might think the more common penis is a better looking one. The problem is, is beauty is an eye of the beholder. So you don't know whether your child will grow up and learn what was taken from him and then see it, like I do, uh, as just a mutilated penis. So it really kind of looks ugly and disturbing and sad. Um, Heck, I, I changed a diaper on a boy that uh, and, and, you know, I was doing a daycare thing and um, and he was recently previously amputated and it really hurt my heart to see that. I felt so bad for the kid. In some ways I hope that he never ever learns, but he probably will in the day of the internet, you know, it's, this information is just getting bigger and wider and more visible. Um, chances are, by the time he's a teenager, he's going to figure it out. Also, I, I kind of think that it's built into the female DNA because the parents of the glands tells them that the male is ready for sex, and women do not understand the feelings they are feeling when they see a penis. Uh, you know, they, they kind of just like automatically get excited, and if and maybe when they see the penis isn't erect or out, then they're kind of like, yeah, okay, well, you're not interested in me or whatever. I don't know what's going on in their, you know, you know, deep inside their brain. You know, it's, it might be the, a virtual thing that they're not aware of. <clears throat> it's very clear that intersex normalization or binary surgeries are frequently about aesthetics. Anything that does not fit the binary view makes people uncomfortable. And understandably, parents want their child to be attractive to the opposite sex, so they have a good chance at a love life, right? I, I get why parents would be concerned about their child not fitting the binary norm. 
And I know some people are going to say, well, there's no such thing as a third sex or whatever. Well, if you have XX and XY chromosomes, okay, those are defining the, the two that you know most people think of as the binary. Well, if you have XXY or, I don't know, some other combination where you have a third, <laughs> a third letter there, uh, how is that supposed to fit the binary? I mean, they're born that way, right? And this is why I think a lot of intersex people agree with me on this is why intersex people think, well, I was born that way. Um, there's nothing really wrong with it. Um, I can have sex. I can enjoy sex. I can um, I can urinate. Why why modify me? Why why was it important to cut me? The, the the term recent term I've seen thrown around in medical stuff is DSD, which is diagnosis of S or disorder of sexual development. Well, how does that fit sexual development? Um, if they're born, if they have a third letter there, going blank on the term right now, but <laughs> if they're if in utero they have this third character um, how how does that fit development I mean it, how is that considered this does it have to be considered a disorder or can, is it is it okay that they're just born that way and that's that's just except that there's other options than the binary. I hope that a lot of intersex people agree with me on that one. I'd love to see the, you know, your ideas and comments. Um, please, please feel free to comment. I'd love to hear it. For female genital cutting, this aesthetic thing this does not always apply since in many cases such as ritual nicks there is no visible difference um, it's, the ritual nicks are more just symbolic right however there does seem to be cases where there is a desire for the labia to be trimmed i, I was just listening to uh, trish Kazi yesterday uh, and she was talking about how um, for porn they sometimes trim the inner labia to make porn more attractive <laughs> wow. Uh, um, and y you can look at documentaries. There's, there's bunches of them on, on YouTube. There's a whole playlist I have. Um, Victoria Nipples uh, created a playlist that has a whole bunch of documentaries on it. And it's, you know, it is, it, it is an aesthetic thing. I mean, some people think, you know, meat flaps or whatever. So, you know, that lady should be trimmed or you know, shouldn't have that clitoral hood there or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, it, it makes me cringe thinking about it at all. Uh, and I'm sure it makes a lot of you that are listening to this cringe as well. But that is the reality in certain cultures. Yeah, and again, the aesthetics connects back to control as there is a desire to look like peers. So, this leads to statements like, they will be made fun of in the locker room, or they need to match. <laughs> uh, need to match dad, or need to match mom, or whatever it is. You know, like, um, no, they don't need to. Um, and teacher kids, pride uh, and confidence, and you know, don't be there for first boy. Uh, you know, if you go cutting off part of the genitalia, um, well, you've already told them that it's a good idea to give in to bullies uh, and to, you know, and to cow, cow down to, you know, your peers or whatever, to conform, to be, to be conformists instead of individualists. And then the last one, um, economics. While there's clearly many financial reasons for individuals to press forward with male genital cutting, there are also for the other two. Let me start with male first. Though. The surgeons slash 
butchers, what do you want to call them? They collect the paycheck. So there's a little bit of greed there. Uh, I've heard so many stories of doctors telling people not the whole truth, and and I gotta you know I gotta acknowledge that there's a lot of doctors out there that simply don't even know the anatomy of uh, of genitalia um, in a, in depth. There, just go look at some medical textbooks. It's really sad, very disturbing that you know these colleges, um, college books, college level books aren't teaching. Uh, details about the anatomy that they'd be cutting off or cutting away uh, and the values and the functions of that genitalia. Uh, the sex loop companies, they, as long as, uh, as long as, <laughs> as long as men don't have that mobile skin uh, there and they don't have that moist glands, they're going to need a sex loop more. It's just, I mean, it's impossible to de to deny. It's you know, you, you got dried out glands if you don't have that uh, the mucosa covering the the glands of the penis. Um, so, uh, and you, all you have to do is look at all the videos that joke about it. You know, about guys you know squirting that lotion on or whatever and and, and doing you know uh, choking the monkey. And the pharmaceuticals, they. They have lots of money. They've got a lot uh, tied up in this. Uh, they, you know, they had to sell that erectile dysfunction uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, drugs like Viagra and other things. And uh, there's some big money in that. And as far as I've heard, uh, the U.S. is the biggest consumer <laughs> of that compared to other countries. So, I, don't, I mean, go do your own research and check it out. You know, it's just what I've heard and read and seen um, myself. Uh, and then, last but not least, the cosmetics industry. You know, all you have to do is go look up Sandra Bullock uh, penis facial, or go look up uh, I guess Skin Medica um, and Oprah. Uh, these things use foreskin, uh, baby foreskin, which is very pure. It's very pure tissue, so there's definitely value in that that tissue uh, to be you know, squirting into your skin to make you know, to keep yourself looking young. So, uh, yeah, that's one side of the economics. Uh, so, I mean, you're talking about billions of dollars here, people, <laughs> in, just in the U.S. alone. And then you've got intersex. Uh, <sighs> The only thing I can think of really for intersex is the paychecks that the surgeons get for doing the surgeries. And in the U.S., we do not have a, a universal health care system. So in order for doctors to get their paychecks, they have to sell a service. So it's just that they don't really make a lot of money just chit-chatting with you, which is kind of sad. I think that we have a lot of opportunities to eat to rearrange our medical system in the U.S. to deal with um, addressing health and not um, driving uh, the medical professionals to act like a bunch of car salesmen. Not, not that I, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of good car salesmen out there that are ethical and all that, but <laughs> that's what comes to mind is, you know, you use car salesmen that, you know, pushes you to buy a car and not leave the lot without buying a car. Uh, and then for female genital cutting, this is an interesting one. Um, not only is there the paycheck for the moils, and yes, they use that term moil in, uh, in the female genital cutting practices because just like the, you know, you got your Jewish moils that do the males, you have moils that cut girls. However, the economics seem to go very deep on this uh, because in these cultures families often need I mean, they need to sell their daughters in order to feed the rest of their family and it's often a trade for you know getting goats and, and sheep and um, and whatever else so they can feed their family so 
you can go look at again, go look at videos on this. This is something that I understand Orchid Project is is really trying to address, and I, everything I've been reading lately is because of the whole pandemic. It's actually the pandemic is making this much worse and increasing the chances of girls getting cut right now. So. Um, how to change those economics so it's not about um, cutting children's genitalia to you know, feed yourself. It, it's it's a big paradigm shift for them to, to go through, and just you know just as it is, it's clearly a big paradigm shift for people in the U.S. to look at you know, the the harms of male. Um, Postectomies, previous foundation, whatever. Uh, I look at the female genital cutting cultures and seen some of these videos, and wow, are they that's going to take a big shift for them to do it. And it sounds like they're making some progress. They're, you know, like I guess it's Somalia that has decided to to cut out a lot of the Islamic rules and uh, and and actually ban female uh, genital cutting practices. Not that it's actually stopping anyone from doing it yet, but at least they're acknowledging it as a problem. Now, I'd like to dig a little bit into um, why the war for genital autonomy is such a difficult one. And be, I guess before I get into that, so you'll notice that I when I talk about genital tatami, I'm talking about the whole bit, and sometimes people from the female or the intersex side, whenever you bring up the male circumcision thing, it's like, okay, well, you're watering down my, you know, you're watering down the intersex cause, or you're watering down the female, you're, 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 you're lowering um, the, the cause to your cause, like, your cause is low down here, and mine is up high up here, that's, I don't see it that way. Uh, actually, the way that my mind has gone with all this genital you know, cutting stuff is it's been, instead of being a downward spiral, it's been an upward spiral. It's been like a tornado in my head. I, I learned a little bit about, I've learned a little bit about male genital you know, cutting, I've learned a little bit about female genital you know, cutting, I've learned a little bit about intersex genital you know, cutting. And, and as I've learned this stuff, I've Real, I've seen how much horror, how bad it really is, that how severe it is, and um, and I do even more than I've ever done, speaking out. I I speak out about female circumcision. I'm sitting here right now, educating you on the harms of female genital cutting practices and the roots of it, and and I'm. Because I'm talking about all of it together, you are learning about what needs to be done and the challenges of, of how to resolve all of these. And I see it as uh, actually someone actually said something on my 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 brought up this this weed to the intersex community as. Um, we do not water down our own cause against genital mutilation by refusing to ally ourselves with the horrors done to other people. The roots of all genital mutilation are the same. Divide and conquer. Ally and, our, and your army becomes everyone against a weak foe. Those holding the knives make a profit and until they have no customers they will not stop cutting. We intersex do not own the cause of ending genital mutilation. And you can replace the intersex with female um, as well. Without a trans woman physician at Fury Hospital, the first hospital that used to commit genital mutilation against intersex in infants to apologize and change its policy, the intersex who have been fighting for decades to get that butcher shop to knock off the sh <laughs> uh, SHIT would never have succeeded. So, gosh. We need more intact men in hospitals speaking out <laughs> against this. Um, and there are, there are, I've seen plenty of stories of um, 
circumcised or very previously amputated um, doctors that are also defending and protecting children in our schools. We just need more of that. And uh, I hope someday uh, a hospital will apologize for what they've been doing to males. Uh, it's been that's great that Lurie Hospital did that. Uh, it's really interesting things that they say. All you do is replace the the intersex with male and done because <laughs> it's it's the same thing. So you might want to go check that out. So the reason that the the challenges of this. This fight for General Dodonov. I've been at, at this for two and a half years. Well, that it's been, I've been it's been two and a half years since I decided to come out publicly against infant both circumcision. And I've become heavily involved among those who fight for General Dodonov. I've seen many challenges that is holding back progress. I think cognitive dissonance is the biggest hurdle and root to many of the others that we'll, that we'll discuss. Facing the possibility that our own genitalia is not better but maybe worse is very difficult to consider. I, I've talked to so many men that are in this and they, they had that, just facing that has been a big hurdle for them and even accepting that it's you just go through all this mm, grief, the grief process. And the way I see it, I actually went through the grief process multiple times over and over and over again because I kept realizing the harms. And if you want to understand what I mean by poor all the harms, it's not just one harm. You know, yes, it's one cut, supposedly a only one thing was cut off, but the harms of that one thing being gone is horrible. There are many harms, and I have a YouTube uh, playlist of those harms. Uh, they're all just short little videos explaining each individual little harm. And the back to what, what it was is that every time I realized how I was harmed, and then I go through the grief process, and then once I get through that, I I suddenly realize, oh, this is another way I'm harmed, and I kind of go through the grief process again. I, you know, I get mad and um, and sad, and yeah, <laughs> just go look at the grief process if you don't understand what I'm talking about when I talk about grief process. And then if you're a parent that had the same performed on your child, luckily. I'm not one of those. I'm not a great parent. I came very close to be, being one. Uh, luckily, we were given some good information and my kids are intact. But I can only imagine if I was not just cut, but I was also a parent that had that done to his child. That would only just compound it. Uh, it the, the cognitive dissonance would just like take a huge leap for me. I, that would be really hard to face that I did something wrong to my child. Something so physically um, and intimately wrong. And then another thing that can compound it even further is if, if you're indoctrinated by religion, culture, or even medical school, or a combination of those you know, like, okay, so you're in the U.S., you're, you're a doctor that is taught that it's good to remove it because of all the medical benefits, and you live in a culture where most are done, and you, you're working in a hospital where the culture within that hospital or medical clinic is, you know, promoting it all the time, and then you are part of a religion that believes that it must be done for, you know, for your supreme being or whatever, oh my goodness, I mean, that's like four or five things just to try to get through someone's head. 
I, I understand why it's really hard for some people to consider this. It, they just, you know, they block and run away or hide or whatever. <laughs> they don't want to face the, the horribleness that all those things are wrong. That their medical school is wrong, their culture is wrong, their religion is wrong. They did something to their child wrong. And they themselves were wronged by their parents. I mean, how many wrongs do you need to really just, like, shut off? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Only so many people can, and I'd really love to see someone comment in here and say, Yeah, I'm from a, I, I went through medical school that taught that, and I'm in a culture that believes that, and I'm, I was raised with a religion that believes that and my own child or children were cut and my own parents cut me. I'd love to meet one person that fits that criteria that is now an antactivist. I applaud you <laughs> if, if you are. I applaud you. Oh, and then on top of that, you know, if you have brothers that went through it too, or even cousins, then I guess I would probably pile on top of that too. So tell me your story. I'm really curious about it. I'd really like to hear it. I'd really like to see it. Um, I'd like to see more blogs uh, from people about uh, what got them to be in or, you know, a video blog or whatever. We're also fighting against the most visible people in the world, holding the most powerful position in politics. If you look at my blog article on this, you know, one of the pictures is of Hillary Clinton. The Hillary Clinton that promoted PEPFAR and the program to, quote, circumcise men in Africa where HIV is heavily prevalent. We're also fighting big money. Um, the wealthiest of the world has spent tons of money promoting general cutting practices. I'm talking particularly about the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. I don't know if they were duped by greedy people that manipulated studies to make it seem like a good idea, or whether they even realized the unintended consequences of supporting harmful practices, or whether they had their own motives. I just know that big money has big influence, and until someone else with big money comes along to counter it, grassroots activism is going to have to get very big to counter it. And on top of that, we also have celebrities. Celebrities like Jim Jeffries. Very, very popular. Uh, I don't know why. I'm not really a fan of his, but he's a and they, they call him a comic, a yeah. comedian, stand-up comedian, but boy, when I watch him, I, I just hear a one-man talk show <laughs> up on the stage. I mean, this guy could just, he could be like a hard journey to sit down behind a microphone and, and say the things that he says, um, but I guess maybe he wants to use his body language to, to show things, too, not just his voice. And nearly half of the world follows one of the Abrahamic religions. Nearly half. Think about that. You, you, know, you got the Judaism, you have the Islam, and you have Christianity. And the root of that is the Abraham um, and what he was supposedly told by God to do to himself and his boys, supposedly boys. Uh, not completely clear about that, and I think that's why it's kind of confusing when you look at uh, female genital cutting practices and uh, and how there's connections to Islam. But just like Christianity has several different sects, you have several different tribes of Islam. Some tribes, you know, different tribes have different ideas about what should be cut from a female. Again, go if if you're, this topic really interests you, go check out some of the documentaries. And some believe that their religion cannot survive without holding to that covenant. 
The fear of not having an immortal soul backed by such a religion is a strong one. I'll say that again. The fear of not having an immortal soul backed by such a religion is a strong one. So we are driven by our fears. And boy, the Islam area seems, you know, their their religion seems to be very much driven by fear. Uh, you know, people don't feel comfortable speaking out. Uh, I've come across some um, people from the Middle East that they they talk about it, but they do so in an anonymity, um, and they say, "Yeah, I can't really say too much because I." Uh, uh, fear for my life here because if I if I go against the Quran or you know my culture or whatever then I you know I can literally have my head cut off or whatever uh, and then add to that the fears of social separation or even death or questioning you know uh, well just just social separation along uh, it, it takes us I think I, I applaud people that are independent and uh, independent thinkers and aren't worried about not being part of the herd. Um, you know, not worrying too much about their family. You know, making them the black sheep of the, of the family or whatever. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's a big fear. I've actually spoken with religious leaders that admit that they will not speak out publicly for fear of losing much of their congregation and support. This is really kind of surprising because it's like in the Christian Bible, it's written in so many places uh, talking about so circumcision. Um, and the Apostle Paul talks about it a lot. It's, it's, it's all over the place in the New Testament. Uh, but when you go to church, you pretty much never ever hear about it at all. Um, you most definitely never hear about the harm of you know what it, the procedure does, and you know no, they never ever go into the details about you know the way it was originally done versus the way that it's been done since the rabbinical change, uh, which is often referred to as uh, instead of Brit Mila, it's Brit Faria or pariah or whatever. I'm not positive which way to pronounce that, but uh, yeah, they it's a whole lot more tissue that's cut off. I've been quite excited by the growth of social media because the mass media has been very redundant and has become too powerful of an influence over society. I, I've seen charts of uh, the mass media and the and the ownership of the mass media and how it near the top of uh, the ownership chain is just a small handful of uh, ultra wealthy people that own the the mass media so in a lot of ways I'm really happy to see that social media is growing but at the same time I, I like for instance Facebook is uh, blocking people or, or removing people's accounts or whatever for you know speaking their minds um, and they're just automatically Assuming that it's wrong information or misinformation or whatever, and that's not necessarily always the case, uh, because the people, the moderators that are moderating the social media, uh, they have their own biases and beliefs and all that, and uh, they might decide to, you know, it's the whole cancel culture thing, which is being talked about a lot lately. Some get defensive when speaking about the harm done to those that are the same sex as they are, and someone else chimes in with the uh, harm done to another sex. So, this is Cloud in the, the case with FGM. Um, this defense is due to the belief that it diminishes the harm to their own sex. I believe that working together for genital autonomy for everyone makes us stronger than if we attempt to gain genital autonomy for only one. I've seen many pictures of groups of people protesting for, you know, for females, or protesting for intersex, or protesting for males, and I can just 
imagine, I, just, I have this picture in my mind of overlapping these pictures together and taking the people from all these different um, groups and having them all stand together and the, you know, you, you don't, you just about multiply this movement by three by bringing all those people together. And trying to determine who is the bigger victim only deters us from focusing on protecting the next generation. This is not a pissing match, people. We don't need to identify who the bigger victim is. Um, you know, you, you, you've got different ways of measuring that, too. It's like when you look at the number of males that are victims compared to females, well, it's a five to one number there because you're talking about a billion males in the world that have been previously amputated or circumcised or whatever you want to call it. And you have supposedly like 200 million females living in the world. And I have no idea how many intersex that's I think that's still being discovered, honestly. Um, it's only come out of the closet in the past few years or so. Uh, and honestly, I, as far as level of harm is concerned, I bet that the most harmed intersex person is probably, really, the most physically, biologically harmed of all three. But again, why are we worrying about who's the bigger victim? Let's just fight for general autonomy for everyone. It's just one thing. Just focus on the one thing. And then we've got victims. I, I, I speak with victims almost every day. Particularly of male cutting. But I also I talk to victims of female genital cutting and um, and a good bit of intersex people too. I have a lot of people on my friends list on Facebook that are intersex people and I've had chats with them. It's it's a tough thing for a victim to be an advocate. And when you think about how many victims are out there, even after they learn the harm and all, um, it really there's not very many people left to do the speaking out. And that's why you often see when it comes to the male genital cutting practices, you see a lot, you often see more women speaking out than you do men. And that's a very interesting topic just right there. When it comes to men speaking out, um, they are usually not very gentle um, about it. They, because they are victims, um, and they are men, uh, or something to it, I don't know. Uh, they will get pretty nasty, and um, and quite often, you know, in some cases, scare people away. But at the same time, I'm not saying men should not be nasty about it. That men should be, you know, they should open up. They should express their anger, um, because if people don't see that men are angry, people aren't going to take this seriously. They're not going to believe this. They're not going to believe that men do complain. So every time victims attempt to advocate for the next generation, they are refreshing in their own mind their own victimhood, reliving it. And I run into this myself sometimes, thinking about this, thinking about my own, the harm done to me. Um, I have to I have to get out of my own head sometimes and, and keep thinking about the children that are getting cut today. This isn't about me. This is about the next generation. It's about the children getting cut today. And I've got to speak out. I've got to do it. But I do recognize it is a very hard thing to do. I mean, you're 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 you're, you're really piling on a negative, right onto another negative. I mean, you're you're. I've met victim, many victims that do not speak out, and as a victim myself, I can see why. So when you do see a person speaking out, imagine that they there are probably thousands more that just do not have the ability to get past their own fight within themselves to speak out as well. I know of one advocate that, has, that was also a victim that committed suicide. 
Uh, you, a lot of you might even know his name, Jonathan Conte. He's featured on American Circumcision documentary. I, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. And he's not the only person that's committed suicide or uh, being circumcised. You can go look it up. And remember that victims include regret parents. Yes, if you're a regret parent, you are also a victim. Maybe not the bigger victim, but you are a victim. <clears throat> Hear this, people. Yes, you might be angry that you were cut by your parents. But your parents are also a victim because they were culturally conditioned. They were indoctrinated. They were convinced by a, a doctor or whatever to harm you. So they too are victims. And I, I get for those of you that are not parents yourself that that's, that can be hard to understand. And for those of you that do come across these people that are speaking out, give them a hug. Give them all the positive vibes you can. Um, maybe in this pandemic thing, maybe not give them a hug, but give them an air high five or something. Um, God knows they need it. I've come across advocates that can't stand with advocates that are also regret parents. I know one that believe that believes all regret parents should go to the police and turn themselves in. Well, if I were the regret parent myself, I probably would. I don't see that the threat of prison time will get more regret parents to be advocates, though. It's sort of how the police deal with drug lords. They make deals with millions to get, or minions, <laughs> sorry, not millions, I spread that. Uh, minions, you know, the people that were working for a drug lord, to get to the drug lords, right? They'll often make deals. So um, we need the regret parents to speak out to. Uh, and if we threaten them, scare them away, or whatever, that's one less person speaking out to protect children. Please, please support the regret parents. Um, again, if I was actually regret for her myself, I probably would go turn myself in because I would want to see that how this would go down in court. Uh, at the very least, I would definitely raise a lot of attention by doing that. On my blog about this, I have a chart that shows five approaches to social change and it goes in all sorts of directions. Uh, working with local groups and networks, influencing professional practice, influencing policy, challenging social attitudes and beliefs, and supporting and advocacy for individ individuals. So I, I see people working all the different angles. Um, for instance, in Taction, it is uh, Tony or Anthony Squadro from Intaction was setting up a another non-profit just to just to do lobbying to try to influence policy over this but uh, that's until we do get more done to um, challenge the social attitudes and beliefs and get more knowledge out there that's going to be a tough one um, typically politicians won't do something unless it's popular that's just a matter of fact that's just the way it is um, I don't know, maybe people in Congress that don't have to worry about losing their jobs, maybe they will speak out. I don't know. Um, maybe that's an upside to not having term limits. <laughs> that's another topic for another day. <laughs> but just a thought there. Um, but that, that image doesn't do justice to the complexity of the many approaches to tackle this issue. There's constant discourse among the advocates like, regarding the best ways to do so. The most common one that fits in the challenging social attitudes and beliefs bubble is whether to approach people with a gentle education method, aggressive shaming method, or somewhere in between. I find that generally victims will use more aggressive methods because they are hurting emotionally. 
like I was saying earlier. But you know, when, when it comes to females, uh, it, it has, I don't know, I don't, I don't see them using very aggressive methods. But when it comes to men, they will get aggressive, and they will use shaming methods. Um, yeah. But yeah, some believe that that approach scares people away, which may be true with me. However, again, if people do not hear the hurt of the victims, they may not believe the victims exist or aren't all that harmed. The challenge here is that people are excluded from various general autonomy groups because differing ideas and approaches. I created genitalautonomysociety.org where every advocate can join with a simple premise that they believe that everyone has the right to the genitalia they were born with. There is no way for other advocates to get into discourse about other issues. However, as much as I tried, one person found out that another individual was registered there and decided not to join just because they disagreed politically with that individual. So much for having one place for all advocates to take a stand of solidarity. Divide and conquer. I guess we're going to let the people, the, the, the people that are, that are pro-parent choice win by dividing us and conquering us. Or you can go sign up and not worry about what the people that are signing up are believing about other things, whether they're flat earthers or anti vaxxers or or for or against abortion or whatever. So just stick to one issue and get one issue dealt with people. Go sign up. I find such behavior very selfish. Let's think about the next generation. We have another challenge, um, and this this is something that happened. That, that things have gotten heated in Alabama twice for the blood same men. One of the first times was Brother K. Uh, he was arrested, and uh, they used a bogus claim, and he, they ended up having to pay a fine and all that. But he was arrested when they were protesting in Alabama. They went back uh, another time and went to Mobile, Alabama, and they were effectively kicked out of the the town because they were threatening to <clears throat> this pisses me off. <laughs> I'm sorry. They were threatening to arrest people, so the blood same men left Mobile, and a lot of us got pissed and went out to the Mobile Police Department's uh, website and um, called them and, and, uh, and, uh, and sent them letters and all that. Uh, Elon Severoni, he's, he's one that's been attacked on multiple occasions protesting in Israel. So it, you know, it's scary to protest, uh, to speak out about this. And I imagine there's real risk, again, in Islamic countries. Uh, there's real risk of execution. There's, there's very little known advocacy in those areas. I, I recently saw, just the other day, a blog. Um, I, as far as I understand it, it was written in Turkish. Um, so someone in Turkey is speaking out. And uh, there's no, I don't know of any organization in Turkey um, speaking out for genital autonomy. I know of people that have lost their job over their advocacy work. Yes. Really, uh, I think this explains in part why so many of the advocates are retired. Because once they retire, they don't really care so much about their job. They, they don't worry about it. Um, I, well, I personally can't prove it. I am confident that my public advocacy has impacted my employability. And how many medical professionals are gag ordered to stay quiet to keep working at hospitals? I, I've come across them. I, I recently talked to a guy um, that is unhappy uh, that he's cut, but his his mother works at a hospital that actually works at the hospital where he was cut. 
So he's afraid to say anything. He's afraid to file a complaint to the hospital. He's afraid to file a criminal complaint to the police. Because he doesn't want his mom to get fired. Are you all seeing the challenges here yet? And I'll, I'll bring this up again. Being ejected from our pack is a severe fear. <laughs> we have a St. Bernard. And I swear, she has nightmares just because she's been locked at home alone at times. So she doesn't get locked at home alone very often. It's extremely rare. But there's times where we just really didn't have any choice. No matter how introverted you are, I think we all need a certain amount of connection and support with fellow human beings. Even in female genital coding cultures, most support the practices and going against the norm can get you shunned from the group. A lot of people think that uh, the female genital cutting happens because men demand it. From what I've seen, it's actually quite the other way around. It's the women that, uh, that keep it going. And the men don't really care. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of men wish that their partners were left alone. While the trend seems to be shifting in the USA, and already shifted significantly in Europe and Australia, this is still a clear challenge. And then, again, back to the medical training materials. A study has, was done that found that a large percentage of medical training materials completely failed to provide the anatomy of the male pre prepuce or prepuce. Someone I know of by the name of Jessica Penn has been fighting to improve medical training materials regarding the anatomy of the female genitalia. So this is not just a male genitalia problem, folks. There's a lot of room for improvement in the medical textbooks. I, I recently went through one sizable one. Um, the urology book and found lots of issues with it and wrote, <coughs> wrote a letter and sent to tell the, the doctors that were involved in writing it or editing it. And I did get responses that they did receive it. They didn't, they haven't gotten any, any feedback about whether they agree with me or anything at all, but I do know that they got it. So. Um, and, and remember, it wasn't too long ago that Dr. Money push general surgeries to make children more fit the binary norm and surgeries based on his views are still occurring people that got their degree based on these are difficult to convince that they didn't learn everything they need to they you know some doctors have a god complex or whatever they got that that uh, you know that MD assignment or whatever and they think well oh, no I know everything I need to know and that's just not true I, I've talked to I've spoken to urologists. I actually had a long conversation with a urologist on the phone. I, I swear it was like an hour, um, where he went through the usual stuff that um, most of us general autonomy advocates have heard time and time again. And I gave up. I gave him, you know, the retorts to that, and he's like, "Oh, you're making good points." He said that. Like, so, yeah. And luckily, this this urologist said, "Well, I actually don't do." Um, um, infant uh, vote circumcisions like deal with problems. That's all I deal with. So he's he's not one of the ones that deal that deal with uh, doing babies unless something gets screwed up. So that was kind of nice to know. And then if all of this wasn't enough, there's censorship. I've seen this in so many ways in so many places in the past so many years. Sometimes I get so frustrated seeing it, I'm driven even more to go stand on a corner somewhere in my bloodstained pants outfit. I hope all this doesn't get you too depressed um, and too down about this. Um, hopefully this gets you driven more to do even more. I've had a lot of success just recently, just in the past well, over a week. <laughs> I got on TikTok and uh, started taking snippets of, uh, of videos from uh, from advocates, and uh, you know, on TikTok they can only be a minute long, so it's really challenging sometimes to get the message squeezed into just one minute or, or less. Um, but I've gotten hundreds of thousands of views and tons of comments, um, so it's been really great. So 
you know, keep keep looking. Um, and if you're not sure about what to do, uh, I know Brendan Murata put out a book about the you know, the Antechnist guy book. There's I also have an article about things that can be done. There's so many things that can be done. You can you can spend all day every day doing these things. I, I do. I as soon as I wake up, my mind is roaring on, on oh, I can go work on this, I can go do this, I can do this. So many things I want to do. Um, I even had to take time out of making the TikTok videos in order to do this, vi this you know, might want to call this a podcast, whatever, I'm just going to put it up on YouTube with a, a couple pictures. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I, hope that, uh, I hope this gets you motivated to to do more and, and give you some ideas on what else can be done to make forward progress. We are making progress, but for me, this can never happen fast enough. I want it done yesterday. I want all genital cutting of children to stop now. Thank you for listening. Hope you like and share.